Okay. And I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and Alan uh, is going to go through some basic instructions for you about Zoom, especially about turning on. Uh, let's see here. Remote control to Alan. Okay. Alan, do you do you have control? You do. Okay. Good. So just hold on a second, Alan. Just for everybody. I'm Tony Bariant. And I am the president of the uh, Hearing Loss Association of America, Mission Viejo chapter, and I want to welcome everybody. And Alan Katsura is our technical assistant today, and he attends most of our meetings. And I, he's going to walk you through some basic instructions, and, uh, and then he's going to give the mic back to me. So go ahead, Alan. Okay. Okay. For most of you here, you will need to know, or you will need the assistance of captions. And I think Zoom normally will start with the captions turned on. If you are unable to see the captions at this moment, you would have to go down to uh, and this is for desktops. If you go down to the toolbar at the bottom of the screen, there will be a live transcript with a CC icon. And you would click on that and you would select Start Subtitles. And that will generate your captions. You are also able to take your captions on desktops and move them wherever you want on the screen so they're out of your way. You're also able to go to subtitle settings and enlarge your captions if you need them to be in a larger size font. Okay, um, Tony usually has the chat function open for everyone and it looks like it's that way today. If you have any questions about uh, using Zoom, you could put it into the chat and I will pick it up there and see if I could help you. Um, otherwise, everyone is welcome to use chat to converse with everybody. Or if you have a friend that you haven't seen in a while, you could just um, message them privately. All you have to do is select, make sure that where it says two, there's a drop down. By default, it says everyone. If you click on that, you'll see a list of participants that are attending, attending the meeting. Okay, today, and in most meetings, we ask that if you have a question, if you go to the reactions icon on the bottom of the screen, normally it's on the far uh, right hand side or possibly it may be under the three dots if your screen is a smaller size and at the very bottom of it there's a bar that says raise hand and what that does is it will show on your profile or your thumbnail picture and also in the participants window that you have your hand raised and you will be called and asked to unmute yourself to ask your question Mike, back to me. It's back to you now, Tony. Yes. Um, yeah, I want to thank our sponsor today, which is Caption Call. Uh, Caption Call actually uh, pays for our real time captioner. Um, Joe Gale is here today from Chicago, and she is typing live um, as we speak, providing the captions. So I thank 
uh, Joe Gale for being here. And I want to thank Caption Call, it provides captioning telephones, both landlines. A landline could be uh, Vonage, um, it, it could be any kind of voice over IP phone, as well as the corded phone. Um, also on your iPhone and on your iPad, which is really great if you're traveling. So those um, are all available at no charge. Um, you do need to call and get information or make an appointment. If you have a caption call phone and you have questions, concerns uh, at all, the telephone number is 877-557-2227. You'll be in touch with customer support. So we thank caption call. Uh, the Hearing Loss Association is uh, a tax, we are tax exempt. And so any deductions you have may be available for your, uh, depending on your tax status. All chapter is volunteer. No one receives any wages of any kind. Um, membership, local membership is not required. We depend on your donations for support. And you can donate online. There's uh, on our website, hlaamv.org. And you can use your credit card and donate or pick up the address and send us a check, which would be great. And let's see. And there's my contact information. If you have any questions, it's Tony at HLAAMV.org. And we're on Twitter and we're on Facebook. So you can find us there. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Okay, I think that's the last one. Yes. All right. So, um, We, uh, yeah, just want to announce that HLAAMV does, does not endorse any single product or service, and this meeting is intended to provide information, education, and support. Um, I wanted you to know this is just a little announcement. I, I do have a really big announcement to give you in just a moment. Uh, Zoom uh, provides captions for anybody with a with a paid account you can set it up and i've been in touch with the emeritus uh director at saddleback uh, college and so he has provided instructions to all of the instructors at saddleback emeritus program on how to set up captions for uh the students so if if you're calling from another area, so we've got, I think, Michigan here and Wisconsin here. So if you might want to talk to your local colleges that are still using Zoom for instruction and tell them, ask them to provide captions. And it's uh, voice um, uh, voice recognition software that, that does that in Zoom at no charge. Okay. Now I've got a... a before I uh, bring Michelle Kapalowitz on, I want to make a big announcement. Uh, this, this really pertains to Laguna Woods residents specifically. Um, we have a hearing loop being installed in the Performing Arts Center. So that means in the theater, and it's happening next week. It's going to be installed. I'll be going down on the last day and testing it out. And um, I'm just so excited because this probably should have been the first place. Um, it was so sorely needed. The equipment was over 25 years old. It was infrared, it was awful. And now we're going to have a hearing loop. So people with T-coil equipped hearing aids will be able to just go in, sit down, turn on their telecoil program and hear everything beautifully that's the plan 
So, yay. Um, you know, this will be the seventh hearing loop that's been installed in Laguna Woods Village. And uh, my next request is to have it installed in the big ballroom in Clubhouse 5. Because I've had a lot of problems in that room using uh, FM equipment. So anyway, I think that's a pretty big um, uh, announcement. And we should all celebrate Laguna Woods that our performing arts theater is going to have a hearing loop. Yay. Um, immediately following uh, Michelle's uh, presentation, I just want to talk uh, a few minutes about the future of the chapter and uh we'll talk about in-person meetings what what what's going on with that and we'll also have an announcement what our next meeting is uh, november 9th and we'll have an announcement about the topic but now i want to get right into introducing you to uh, michelle um Kapolowitz, yeah, oh, wait a minute, I did that. What did I do? <laughs> I mistakenly highlighted myself. Um, Alan, would you um, do a highlight on Michelle? So Michelle is currently um, an assistant specialist working with Professor Fan Gang Zeng, who is just wonderful. We're going to have him back next year. Um, and in, he, she works in the hearing and speech lab at the University of California, Irvine. And she's received her MS and her PhD degrees in cognition and neuroscience from the University of Texas in Dallas. And she's completed a three-year postdoctoral fellowship with UC Irvine Center for Hearing Research. And her research interests are concerned with various aspects of auditory learning and memory, uh, such as how humans can adapt to difficult listening situations and how this adaptation process breaks down with hearing loss. Uh, currently, Dr. Kapalowis, I want to give you that title. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I know we don't have to use it. No. Uh, she's working to characterize um how her new i'm gonna let her break the news <laughs> her new potential treatment uh would improve auditory processing for normal hearing and for people with hearing loss so uh and with that michelle i'm gonna the mic goes to you and you're free to share your screen um I think right now it doesn't have the uh, ability to let me share. It's uh, I think that was removed somehow. It says only host can share. So if maybe if I made a co-host that will. Okay, let me, you are a co-host. Okay. You were so... sharing before. Yeah, okay. and now I can share again, whatever you did that works. So let me try that again now. And uh, all right. See if this works. Okay, everybody can see. There you go. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you, Tony, for such a wonderful introduction. And um, I don't know for those of you that might have been here for my last talk, but I was fortunate enough to be able to speak here before. And I'm so honored to be back with you all again. So thank you for letting me be here today to talk about this potential new treatment. Um, also, because my screen is kind of taking up the whole thing, I don't think I'll be able to easily see if some of you do use the hand raising. So if anybody can chime in and let me know if somebody has a question just to interrupt me to stop so I can take questions. And I'm happy to entertain questions as I give the talk just to help clarify anything. So just please feel free to interrupt me as needed. Uh, and with that, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna share with you some of the work that we're doing in our lab uh, looking at a possible treatment that can help to treat age-related auditory processing deficits um, and how we came about thinking this treatment might be ideal in the first place. Okay, uh, let me see my slide is, uh, there we go, okay. So just to give a little overview of what 
will do for organizing the talk is I'll give you a little background about hearing loss and cognitive decline and the link between those two and why that's important to consider both of these. Um, and what is this promising treatment and how we came about thinking that it might work. Um, and I'll give you some brief findings that we recently published in our lab related to this treatment, as well as what we're planning now with our upcoming clinical trials study that we are uh, about to begin. Um, and I think that will leave us with plenty of time for question and answers. So, is, sir, are we okay? I thought I heard a question. <clears throat> I have a comment, please. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I don't have a hearing loss. And I feel that you're speaking a little too fast. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if the others are having the problem. Yeah. Let me try Just go to go down a little. Sure. If if it happens again, definitely let me know. And I will do my best to not speak too quickly. So thank you for drawing attention to that. Okay, so let's start with hearing loss and cognitive decline. So we know that. Um, age-related decline in, in any kind of auditory processes can certainly impact multiple factors. And I've highlighted here just a few of these factors that we know are of particular importance, such as quality of life, speech perception, social isolation, and cognitive decline. And I'm highlighting cognitive decline here because, again, something we know is this particular point here, which is that the greatest risk factor for actually developing Alzheimer's disease and other dementias is hearing loss. And this was um, well established from a lot of labs, but put together by a Lancet Commission in 2017 and again in 2020 that look at all of the different potential factors and hearing loss was on top for uh, in both of these cases. Um, there are interventions such as hearing aids and cochlear implants that can help to treat some aspects of the hearing loss. And some may even minimize cognitive decline. So for example, it's been well established that people with hearing loss who do not use their hearing aids have worse cognition than those who do use their hearing aids. So that provides us some evidence saying that if we do treat the hearing loss, perhaps we can also treat or prevent the cognitive decline. Uh, we don't know for sure that there's a causal link here, but it looks promising. And that is part of what we're trying to characterize in our lab and a couple other labs are doing the same. But one issue here with the hearing aids is that actually 80% of those who need them don't end up using them. And cochlear implants, they are limited to the profoundly deaf population. Obviously they require an extensive surgery um, and neither devices fully restore auditory function. So we do have this added need for treatments that target both hearing loss and cognitive decline. And it would be nice if this treatment could possibly use together with hearing aids or cochlear implant devices. So when you think of a promising treatment, some, some of the general things that you might think of that would be important would be, well, it should be effective at treating the, the, the issue at hand or issues in this case. It should be safe. And I say here minimal and tolerable side effects because pretty much nothing exists that has no side effects for every person. So knowing that we will encounter some side effects, it would be nice if those were very minimal and tolerable for those who do encounter them. Certainly ease of use. So for example, for most people, perhaps taking a pill would be easier than giving themselves an injection or even going having to go to a clinic to, to, to obtain treatment. Low cost, I think that's a given. And ideally, easy to obtain, uh, specifically if you don't even need to go to a doctor to get it. So over-the-counter medications um, and, and, and minimize having to fight with uh, you know, your uh, insurance companies. So we know I, in that sense what would be ideal for a treatment, but another thing we need to consider in terms of whether or not it would be effective. There's some overriding sound. 
Is everybody muted? Do you hear me clearly now? You're okay. <clears throat> there was something that kind of flashed in, but there weren't any open mics. Huh. So it's kind of strange. Yeah, hopefully it doesn't. If it happens again, we can pause again and figure it out. So I'll, I'll continue now. Um, so here uh, on this slide, what, what I'm trying to capture is that we know these general things that we just talked about that are important for an ideal treatment. But obviously, for something to be effective, we need to know the mechanism or at least a potential mechanism that would be important to target for the drug treatment. And in this case, there are these receptors that are all over the brain called acetylcholine receptors. And they're very important for learning and memory, you know, uh, attention-related tasks, as well as sensory-related tasks. Um, and this picture is just showing you different views of the brain, and, and there are two types of these receptors. There's muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, which we see with the pink color. So in those areas, the receptors are limited to just those types of this receptor. And then the nicotinic receptors, which are uh, sorry, which are um, the turquoisey areas, and those are another subtype. However, the green is the important one here, which is that both of these receptors are essentially everywhere in the brain. They do have some areas they are more specifically reserved to, but ultimately they're all over the place. And the receptors that are particularly important for cognition and, and auditory processing are the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So we, we know that these receptors are activated by attention-related release of this neurotransmitter called acetylcholine in the brain. So anything that requires attention is really going to activate uh, this release and the binding of, these, of this molecule to these receptors, which help us in, these in, in the processes that require, like attention-related processes. Performance in sensory related tasks, so, such as hearing, um, is improved by activating these recept receptors and impaired if you block the receptors. For example, certain drugs can block the receptors, or maybe you have a disease induced loss of these receptors. Actually, we lose these receptors as we get older, and I'll show that in a little bit. And an auditory cortex, important for processing sounds, uh, obviously, uh, for example, if we activate these, then these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors will help in, especially in cases where you have to understand speech in difficult listening situations. So they'll help the individual neurons to activate and respond more to the frequencies that are of interest to you as a listener, while tuning down or minimizing the activation for other unwanted sounds. So this inhibition of the unwanted sounds to allow you to focus on the attention to the sounds you want to hear. These receptors are important for that. And so also, as I kind of briefly mentioned, I do want to highlight that activation of these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are also very important for cognitive functions. And this is evidenced by many studies that investigate learning, memory, and attention. And I'm not going to go over those today because I'm an auditory scientist, but I do want uh, to make that point known that this is well characterized and well understood that these receptors are important for both. And then also, interestingly, they're not just limited to the brain. We have these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in our ears on our hair cells. So the hair cells in our ears help us to process sounds. They're, they are the sensory receptors that take the sound signal that comes into your ear and sends it off to, to the rest of the brain for further processing. And we know that they're important here um, in that they're activated by sound and they help with inhibiting, just like in the brain, unwanted sound or suppressing the hair cell function. Um, by way, actually, of the messages coming back from the brain to these hair cells. 
And so it works like a negative feedback loop. And it helps you again to improve paying attention for target hearing sounds while suppressing those unwanted or background sounds that you don't want to, to that, that aren't important. And another very important part of these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are for protection of the outer hair cells against noise trauma. And over time, more and more noise exposure, loud noise that we, we uh, are exposed to is going to damage these outer hair cells. And so with age, and we get hearing loss with that, a lot of that is due to the damage of these outer hair cells that are very sensitive to noise trauma. So uh, it, these receptors are, are very useful to protect against that. And I had mentioned a little bit about how we lose these receptors with age. And so this is showing you an uh, example of that happening in primary auditory cortex. So for the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, they're, they're made of these different subunits. And so this is just looking at some of those subunits showing you across the different layer of the brain, uh, as we see um, on kind of the x-axis for each of these, that we have um, these receptors across all the layers. WM is just white matter. It's a control that this research group put to show we don't really have any receptors or little to no receptors there. So, so we're counting the number essentially of these transcripts that are there. And in the dark blue is showing you the young, the number in the young versus the aged brain tissue in this region. And the aged tissue has a significant number less than the young tissue of these receptors. So this really also shows us that this might be a target of interest if we think about the importance of trying to, te uh, to treat age-related cognitive decline and age-related uh, decline in auditory functioning. And if we target these with a drug, it perhaps can help enhance that top-down cognitive resources to, to allow them to help individuals to better disambiguate speech. So a possible treatment option, when we think about all of that, that might check all of these boxes that we wanted, as well as target these receptors that are particularly important for cognition and for audition. Um, I don't know if you can guess, I have anybody with a chemistry background here that might uh, be able to recognize uh, either, you know, I have the, the compound here in the corner or if any botanists are there, what the plant is. But another giveaway is that the receptor subtype was named after what binds very nicely to these receptors that we can get what we say is exogenously or outside of the brain that we can put in a drug form and give to the brain to activate these receptors. So if anybody can guess, either by way of the name, the plant, or the compound here, it's nicotine. So I don't want everyone to get scared by seeing that word. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about why it does check these boxes in a little bit. Um, and with that, I just want to really strongly stress that I am in no way here to advocate for smoking. In fact, smoking nicotine, so getting nicotine by way of smoking has been shown to be more detrimental for, for hearing. It's not going to help you. It, it, it has a different, much faster rate of, of entering into your system. So when you smoke something, you're going to have that effect much more rapidly and therefore much more potently. So you're going to get some unwanted side effects from that. Um, it may impair performance on auditory tasks, as well as um, cancer and all of the other chemicals that they put in, in smoking you know, cigarettes or e-cigarettes or whatever else is out there. So, so Please understand that smoking is not the, the answer here. And when, when I use the word nicotine, try not to think of it as a synonym for smoking and instead try to think of it more as just a drug treatment in a clinical sense. So now that we've made that point clear, uh, we know that nicotine treatment does enhance cognitive function. And we know that it actually reduces 
dementia symptoms. And it's also non-habit forming when it's taken topically or orally. And that's because again, the route of administration doesn't allow it to enter the system quickly enough to get that feeling that would make you addicted to it. So, um, and as you can see, probably all of you have heard of nicotine gum or the nicotine patch. Uh, that's widely available. Uh, we get, get this over the counter. And um, drug companies are also already working on their own similar drugs that will mimic nicotine to treat various age-related disorders. So we can already get it over the counter. Um, and of drugs that, of course, the companies want to make money, so they, they'll probably, uh, they're going to do research as well, and they are working to, to, to make their own version of this that uh, uh, actually could, could even be better. Right now, we have this available uh, but it can certainly be better. And with that in mind, I do want to add another point that I'm not telling you to go out and buy these things to help your audition. Um, I, I, we are newly investigating how this treatment might help with hearing related deficits, but we don't thoroughly know that yet. Again, we're in clinical trials, so um, pay attention, see what comes out, and perhaps this will be this uh promising treatment will, will come to fruition. But as of right now, I don't go out and buy it and treat yourself. That's not what I'm here to say. I'm just here to say what behind the curtains is going on. Okay, so um, I just want to summarize that uh, kind of what we know from activating this nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, the drug itself also helps with processing relevant sounds while filtering out the irrelevant sounds. And if the receptors are gone um, or non-functioning, as a reminder, we know that the sound discrimination will be impaired. And giving this drug, just like activating the receptors, does help to protect the outer hair cell damage in the cochlea from exposure to loud sounds. So I have the picture here showing you, this is in a chinchilla ear, which is quite similar to a human ear. Um, that shows on the left uh, these normal, healthy outer hair cells. They're in the three layers. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, but we have the three, the base of it, and then the, the part that's sticking out here on the top. So it looks nice and healthy, but if you go over and look at an ear that was exposed chronically to loud sounds, they're just essentially obliterated. And think of our lifetime, lifetime exposure to loud sounds. It's very hard to avoid that. And when we're younger, we have more of these receptors to help protect us. But as we get older and we lose these receptors, this can be possibly more likely to happen. Um, okay, so see, I don't, my slide is, oh, there we go. Sorry, it was a little delay in. All right, so just to summarize these points again, uh, with increasing age, it becomes harder to filter out the noise from the target sounds. Think about trying to understand speech in a crowded restaurant. And we know that nicotine increases inhibition to help with this process. So again, kind of helping with attention to, to tone down the, the sounds we don't want to focus on and, and allow us to pay more attention to the important sounds. And the amount of these receptors does decline with age, but nicotine treatment can actually help us regain some of these loss receptors. So I hope with that background that I have done a good job to convince you that the word nicotine is not quite so scary in this sense, like it would be with smoking, and that the reason that we chose nicotine is because it is great to target those particular receptor subtypes that are so important for cognition and auditory processing. And now I'm going to show you what we have done a little bit in our lab to use nicotine as a treatment and see what that looks like in behavioral studies and tell you about what we're planning for our clinical trials. So, this is our paper that we published this year, and it's looking at different auditory tasks and how giving nicotine treatment helps performance. And we compared this looking in both young adults and elderly human non-smokers. So as I said, we don't 
want smokers because they can already have other issues and giving them more nicotine is not going to help. So it's uh, key that we uh, are investigating non-smokers here. And another important point is the people that participated did all have normal hearing in the range that we tested for our these experiments. For sure, most of the elderly listeners did have high frequency hearing loss, but we did not test those frequencies in these experiments. So the first test we looked at is called frequency discrimination. And it's about like it sounds. So what you do is you play two different tones and you change how different those tones are in frequency. And you try to figure out what is the just noticeable difference that a listener can detect, oh, these are two different sounds. We also looked at something called frequency modulation identification. And this is looking at another important component of speech perception, which is over time, frequencies are changing a lot with speech. And this is looking at how easily are we able to detect changes in the frequency, whether it's going from high to low frequency or low to high, when those are embedded in background noise. So how loud can that noise be relative to the signal for you to get the answer correct? And then we looked at intensity discrimination, which is just... Do we have a question? Okay, I'm gonna, for intensity discrimination, we were looking at instead of differences in two sounds in terms of their frequency, we were having listeners tell us the just noticeable difference in loudness between two sounds. So how much of a difference does there need to be in the volume for listeners to say, oh yeah, this one is louder than that one. And so for the results for the first study, I have highlighted here um, this one part of the figure on the left, which is showing you that as, as we replicated from previous studies, that there is just in the task itself a, a difference between young listeners and older listeners, where the older listeners had more trouble with this task. They actually needed a greater amount of difference between those two tones in order to be able to say those were different sounds. So if you think about what I mentioned with the nicotinic receptors, if you, if you do, they would help you to need less of a difference because your neurons are refining, firing very specifically to the sounds that you want. But in this case, you have more broad, more broad responses. Therefore, you need more of a difference to be able to tell. And so that's, that's what we're seeing here as evidence in the elderly listeners. Um, and that's really pre-treatment, just looking at pre-treatment, what happens. Now, when we compare pre-treatment relative to the post-treatment, uh, that's what I'm showing you here. These are individual data points. And again, the, just, just like what I just showed, red will always be in these figures representative of the elderly listeners and blue will be representative of the young listeners. And these listeners were, the same listeners were given both placebo and nicotine on different days, so we could compare their performance. And the solid dots here represent when they were given nicotine, and the open circles represent when they were given the placebo treatment. And so this is pre versus post. And the line in the center is to give you an idea of if you are above the line, performance got worse for you after treatment, regardless of what the treatment was, and then below the line, treatment was better. So if you look at uh, some things that stand out here, the red dots are further away from that kind of that, that point on the innermost point in the graph. And that, that means that overall, pre-treatment and post-treatment, the older listeners performed worse. And then another point to notice is that the filled circles, which is the nicotine treatment, those primarily fall below the line versus the open circles that are primarily above the line. So 
that points out what we see here, which is that the placebo really didn't do anything for the groups. This is this is when we combine them now. But as a, as a whole, whether you're young or older, nicotine did something here. It it helped it helped you uh, relative to no nicotine. So relative to your pretreatment performance. This figure is where we were wanting to know whether or not your baseline performance might affect how much of a benefit you would get from the nicotine treatment. So if maybe you perform better or worse at the beginning, perhaps you might have more of a benefit than the other listeners that performed in the middle. So that's what we looked at here. And we actually did not really find any correlation there between those. So we cannot predict in this task, your baseline performance cannot predict what kind of effect you might get from nicotine. We just know you'll get help, but it, but it doesn't matter actually. The baseline performance doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, you, you will get help regardless and you don't get more help in either way. There is a trend towards listeners, I would say that did better on their baseline that get more help with the nicotine here, but it was not significantly different. So we can't, we can't really call that a predictor here. And now for the next task, this is the frequency modulation identification. So we're looking in this case at how much noise the listeners could tolerate to be able to tell that there was this change in the frequency. And again, we see as highlighted here, there's a difference where the younger group performed better than the older listeners. And that is again shown here. Uh, you can see just by the differences in the, the, the red is clustered further out on that diagonal line versus the blue. And another point here is that actually, regardless of treatment here, they're all kind of falling on the diagonal line, meaning treatment or placebo did nothing, really nothing happened. Listeners, they did how they're gonna do and there wasn't much of a change from pre relative to post treatment. And that is captured here where we, where we see no differences um, in placebo or nicotine. And as you would uh, expect, since we saw no differences in treatment there, there's certainly not gonna be any predictor of your baseline performance because the drug doesn't do anything in this particular task. But moving on to intensity discrimination. So interestingly here, we actually, I'm gonna catch my other slides up in case I need any notes here. We actually did not capture a statistically significant difference in how the young versus the elderly performed. But I wanna note that previous studies have seen this difference. Perhaps we didn't have enough listeners to capture it, um, but whatever it is, we didn't have a difference statistically in these two groups for this task. And that can be seen here because the colors, the red and the blue are just overlap. They're mixed together. So you can't really say that one group overall was worse than the other group. Um, and also we do seem to have some clustering of some that are above the line and some that are below with a lot of the ones being above the line performing worse being due to placebo. And that's, that's shown here. So we do have an effect of treatment, but, but the, the pull of this effect is largely due to the fact that for some reason, when people were giving placebo, again, sorry, I didn't stress this before, the black is after treatment and the white bars are before treatment for each of these. So after placebo, for some reason, listeners did worse. And I can speculate here, but it's pure speculation without further testing. But perhaps one, one explanation we, we might think is maybe this task is causes maybe a little bit of uh, cognitive or uh, um, listener fatigue. And, and maybe the nicotine prevented that somehow. Maybe the nicotine kept you at your baseline, but the placebo didn't. So maybe you got tired after. I mean, it's, it, this is again, really far reaching speculation because, 
because this is not a, a result we would expect. Placebo, you would ideally like to be no change. But the key finding of this test is actually that regardless of whether you are young or old, your baseline performance, so how you did originally before treatment, does predict strongly your benefit of getting nicotine treatment. And in fact, those who perform worse initially get a greater benefit from the nicotine treatment. So, so this, this means independent of age for this task, nicotine treatment helps you if you're already having a problem in the first place relative to other listeners. So just to summarize the findings from that paper, uh, we, we do know that there are age-related differences in auditory processing prior to treatment. And we only tested three things in this case, but there are, there are other, other things we will be testing in our future work. But we see that clearly. The benefits from the nicotine treatment do seem to be task dependent. So, you know, it's, it's not going to be a miracle drug that fixes everything as we would expect, but it does seem to help in some tasks and maybe not so much or at all in others. And then for people who have auditory deficits, maybe not even limited to just older individuals, the benefit from this nicotine treatment could actually depend on the severity of the impairment. So nicotine may actually help those who have more severe deficits. And this is what our ongoing work is aiming to better characterize. So we wanna understand again, more thoroughly how nicotine treatment might help with auditory processing, what groups might help, might it help with, and uh, in what conditions might it help with. And, and also to better understand that mechanism behind it, if it's related to the, maybe the lack of inhibition uh, due to attention related deficits. So for our future work, uh, the plan experiments that we have, this is the clinical trials that uh, we have uh, ongoing and we're, we're setting up right now. We would first start just like anything is with taking hearing thresholds. And I think probably those of you in here who have had your hearing checked recently, which hopefully is everybody, um, is that this audiogram here on the right, and we have the frequency, the different tones that we check um, on the top here. And what you do is you, you just kind of turn the volume up, so the decibel level, to see what is the threshold, the lowest uh, loudness level that, that a listener needs to be able to detect that tone. And this is an example here for both ears that something very common that happens to us with age, which is high frequency hearing loss. So normal hearing would be this, this uh, kind of gray bar that goes across at 25 dB. So anything lower than that, meaning the volume doesn't need to be that loud and you still detect a sound, entails normal hearing clinically. And then anything that you needed to be louder than that would be considered a hearing loss. So we do that first. And then uh, we also, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the two behavioral, we have these two behavioral tasks that we plan to do. Uh, one of them is amplitude modulation, because we do know this is impaired in elderly listeners, and it's very important for speech recognition. And so we have some data here on the right to show you the difference between a young adults versus older listeners. Um, and, and amplitude modulation detection is looking at the percentage of the difference in the change in the, the energy of the signal, uh, which happens all the time. It fluctuates with speech all the time. And so looking at how much fluctuation is needed for you to be able to say there's a difference in that sound. Young listeners, they're nicely clustered together here uh, and they do pretty well. Older listeners, we see much like we saw in our other data, some of them perform just like the younger individuals and some of them don't. So trying to see if we can understand why these listeners here are not performing as well and can we rectify that problem and, and have them perform just like their younger hearing counterparts. Uh, this is something that is one of our goals with this treatment. Um, and we would also be looking at a tone and noise detection task. And we did do this study also uh, that we published in 2020 
where we saw that for this task in young adults, nicotine improved performance. And we definitely need to test this in the older population to see if how, how well nicotine would help uh, for this task. Because this task is really important for going back to when I mentioned talking about understanding speech, say, in noisy conditions. So this is exactly what this is testing is, can you detect a target sound while suppressing all of that noise going on in the background? So we're gonna look at that too. And then we wanna pair those behavioral tests with electrophysiology. So we can see what the brain is doing and, and, and see if those things look like they're kind of doing the same thing, the behavioral versus the brain response. Because a lot of the previous research that we have has been done in animal models. So there's a strong need to do more of this work in human models to really say whether or not these receptor subtypes are the driving force behind this and whether or not we can treat it with nicotine. So these electrophysiological responses that we'll be looking at, they're called envelope following responses. And it's, we will play the same kind of sounds we play in the behavior test and look at what is the brain doing with that response. And so I have here plotted a plot with the young listeners and a plot with the older listeners. And this is the amplitude on the y-axis, which is showing you the strength of that response, like how much is that response relative to changes, which is on the x-axis, of the depth of that amplitude modulation. And with increasing depth, we do see we get, in a lot of listeners, greater responses. And that's expected. But it's pretty tightly coupled here. You know, there's not that much variability across these listeners. But when you look at the older listeners, again, the, just like the behavioral response for the same task, the brain is doing the same thing. Some of them are responding like the younger listeners but some of them are having too much of a response. So perhaps this is a lack of inhibition going on. And the, the figure on the right is just showing you that there is a correlation between the behavior and the electrophysiology. So this is just saying that this is a great way for us to really combine, okay, one, we, we have an issue here that needs to be fixed and we can see it behaviorally and we can see it electrophysiologically and then we give the drug to the system and see if we can, can fix these differences and make the older listeners perform like the younger listeners, or at least the older listeners who, who, are, who need it. And we would do this for both tasks. I'm just giving the example of the one here. And we're also going to, because nicotine is a drug and I said there are potentially side effects, we're going to actually look at that. We're gonna look at pulse rate, we're gonna look at changes in mood as a result of it and any other, you know, some other side effects as well that, that could be common uh, that people report with nicotine treatment. Um, and we're using a dosage that should make these changes minimal to none, but we still wanna characterize them and see if certain groups might experience more of these side effects because drugs are not metabolized the same across age and even across gender. So we really want a better control for this in our clinical trials. And certainly, as I really think is the most important part of this study, is that link between cognitive decline and, and the auditory decline that happens with age. So we're going to look at cognition. We're going to have a couple of tests that we give so that we can also look at what's happening cognitively while simultaneously looking at what's happening in the auditory processing. And if anybody here might be interested in participating in the study, uh, the participants that we need should be between the age of 18 and 85, all sexes and non-smokers. And if you are not in that age range, or if you have severe hearing loss, so some hearing loss is fine, but severe hearing loss, if you can't hear the sounds, we won't be able to do these tests. So, um, and any history of psychiatric illness, neurological disorders, diabetes, or kidney failure, or cardiovascular diseases, we wouldn't be able to have uh, anybody participate with, with those, any of those impairments. And then um, any regular use of prescription medications because 
I know a lot of us have, even I have a lot of medicine I take, but um, unfortunately that would be a confound. So we have to, to not have that in the system while we have another drug in the system. So we really know that the effects we see are from the nicotine. And obviously if you're dependent on illicit drugs, we would not be able to include you. But anybody that's interested, we will be starting these uh, experiments soon. And if you would like to contact me, I have my email address here. And if, or if you just want more information um, and, and also you can find this, uh, more details about this study on uh, the clinicaltrials.gov website um, where, where we have, again, my contact information, but more extensive details about what we plan to do with that. And I'm happy to put this screen up again if uh, anybody wants to see this. Um, also, I have uh, shared my slides with Tony if anybody would like copies of them. So I want to end this talk with some key take home points. So if you remember anything at all from this talk, these are the points that I would like you to take home with you and uh, hopefully give you some new knowledge from this talk, if anything. So the first is that the greatest risk factor for developing Alzheimer's and other dementias is hearing loss. So we need treatments that target both cognitive decline and hearing loss. And nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are important for both cognition and audition. And we lose these receptors with age. But nicotine treatment can actually rectify several of these issues as we discussed. And we're hoping to further look into that to see what more exactly that it can help with and understanding how and why. So that's what our new clinical trials are working on. And with that, I would like to thank the National Institute of Health for the research grant that is funding this. This grant is shared across four different labs. And these are the names I have listed are the four principal investigators that are in charge of this. I am working under the direction of Professor Feng Zhang on the part that I presented to you today. But these collaborators we have are working on the other pieces of that puzzle so that we can really have an end product that hopefully brings more light on, on the potential of this treatment. And, and finally, um, the Center for Hearing Research, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. And that allows this collaboration across these labs to take place. So with that, I am happy to take any questions from the audience at this point. And I hope I didn't confuse anybody with it. Okay. Um, Robert. Right? So Robert Hall, you want to unmute yourself? Hi, Robert. Robert? Okay. There we go. All oh. right. So Hi, uh, it, it, I did a lot of work with nicotine replacement therapy for stop smoking for years. And all the things we had learned was that when people start smoking, especially young people, the number of nicotine and acetylcholine receptors doubles or triples and they don't go away. But clearly they do with age. So, yeah, actually, uh, when you first start smoking, uh, you get more of these receptors. This is correct. And that's what partly because of brain. So, oh, I like this. Let's let's make more of these receptors and you get a stronger effect initially. However, you habituate. So the brain learns that, oh, wait a minute, because it's, it's dangerous to give too much of anything. So the brain actually gets rid of some of those receptors, even if you're not older, just to protect itself. And you end up needing to smoke more to get that effect. So this is why there's this, one of the reasons we do have this issue where with people who smoke because you get the down regulation of those receptors or the habituation in general, just from too much nicotine in the system. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing your treatment, what kind of nicotine do you use? 
we are using the gum and we are doing this acutely. So uh, there are some uh, studies out there that look more chronic treatment of these and, and see a beneficial effect over the course of say a couple months. But for us right now, we're just interested in, in one term, a uh, one-time treatment of this to see what is happening there. And then we can go from there to see that because uh, there, there is a fine line. Again, you don't, you don't wanna give too much of, of the drug to the system. So yeah, one time nicotine gum, and and that's that's what we're doing. <laughs> okay, yeah, because uh, the the real addiction comes when you heat nicotine and get it into your lungs. That's right, and, the smoking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so gum is pretty benign. Yeah, exactly, and that's been well studied that it's not addictive because it's it takes longer to metabolize and it's slower. It stays in the system a little bit longer as well, but it's just, it's it's more, uh, rather than getting this extreme spike and yes. coming back down, it's just like this. So people don't really even notice it much at all, as you probably know if you tried that when you quit smoking. Yeah. When you when you smoke and inhale, then you get a rush. You That's don't right. Rush them. Not at all, yeah. yeah. Thank you for bringing that up so people know we're not trying to get anybody hooked on. Well, one of the things I'd be concerned about, though, is that the nicotine gum is difficult to use. You have to chew it and then park it between your cheek and gum and all that. And I thought the lozenge seemed to be easier. People just stick it there and they don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Um, no, I actually absolutely agree with you. And in fact, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm wishing we could move to the patch, in fact, because uh, that's even easier. And, and uh, we, it, it actually stays in the system a little longer. And you also control uh, how much goes into the system better that way, because when you have anything in your mouth, it's going to go through first pass metabolism through the stomach. Uh, if it, whatever doesn't get absorbed into the mucosa, you're going to lose that. So it's harder for us with gum or even a lozenge to fully say how much nicotine is entering the system without taking blood samples, uh, we, which we might do in the future. We're trying to minimize any of that, though, for now, uh, which actually changes in heart rate um, and other measures gives us a good indicator that the drug is in the system. So ideally, we don't want to have to collect blood samples, but given what you said, this is true. And so this also probably accounts for some of the variability we see is because not every person is going to necessarily get the same dose with the, with the lozenge or the gum. Yeah. But it's easy. It's safe. And we're just first trying to see, are we going to get a, a benefit at all in, in a decent amount of people? From there, with the clinical trials, obviously, you go to more specific and more, you know, looking at maybe dose response curves and, and better controlling for that. But you'd have to make uh, gum in a, I mean, patches in a very low dose, right? Like um, one two milligrams? No, they, uh, the, the, the work that's done with the patches are done with what they already have. Uh, so so um, in the gum, in fact, we have to give more than one piece because we do need a little bit more than the one dosage for the gum, but the patch is already good on its own. So uh, yeah, we, we do have to increase the dose of the gum. It's not quite enough. Yeah. But, uh, and you're right, we, the directions we have to give the participants uh, to park it there, chew it, you know, it's a, it is, it's a, that's probably the least fun part of the, the study is, is chewing the gum. <laughs> really? So the other thing, though, if you go to patches, you have to watch out for rashes. Oh, it can, yeah. can be anaphylactic shock. Oh, goodness. So maybe under that patch. Maybe this is more of the reason that we're doing just we're better to think of the gum. Problem. This uh, is good to know. No, this is, yeah. I, I'm, I'm hearing these, your thoughts. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Robert. Any, anything mm -hmm. else? Or I know there were some other hands that were raised as well. Okay, and... um, yes, thank you very much for your presentation. It was excellent. Um, oh, thank you. I am the audiologist consultant for the group. Um, so I loved all the information that you gave regarding hearing loss and the ability for the uh, brain that we lose the ability to filter that background noise that is happening physiologically in the brain. But I wanted you to comment a little bit about
um, the neuroplasticity of the brain. And although you are making changes chemically, that we do have the ability to also relearn how to listen in background noise through other exercises such as oral rehab. Are you taking any of that into account um, with your research? Well, we're not because it, well, we, we, we take it into account that ideally uh, something that absolutely should be recognized is, it, you know, in addition to say hearing aids or cochlear implants also, yeah, maybe oral fits So these practicing certain, certain tasks. If you practice at them, you can get better at them. That's been shown. Absolutely. But, but uh having people practice all of these different tasks that may be responsible because all of them are important for hearing. So perhaps the drug might be able to it, 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 uh, maybe get, it's like a net, cast in a sure. wider net, but it would be actually more, even more ideal to probably pair it with that. And in fact, because you are um, increasing a system that's so important that that does help with cognition. Presumably, if they are doing these kind of tasks that you're talking about, you might get even more of a benefit. And that's actually an excellent point and yeah. something. Well, now that you say it, I, I would be very interested in trying to test that because it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. 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 So great point. Yeah. Well, and the hearing aids today are getting better and better at separating through artificial intelligence, separating the speech, which is very spiky in nature from the background noise, which is steady state. Yeah. So the hearing aids themselves, as the quality of the products get better, also help try to give the brain that clean, clear signal to Absolutely. process. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't going to mention much about that. I thought about it, but you know, even even the our lab, we have people in our lab working on trying to better these algorithms that help with the machine learning, because really, hearing aids. They, if you guys have all heard of this Internet of Things phrase, hearing aids are are wanting to be on that bandwagon. They're wanting to do even EEG measures and things. That they're they're working very hard to be able to, you know, say use the EEG to better capture uh, capture attention. So what what signal do I want to pay attention to? Who is mm -hmm. the target speaker? And so we're you know we're not quite there yet, but even companies like Facebook and Google and they're all working on this Apple uh, in addition to other companies. So so uh, hearing aids, yeah, we I'm excited to see what's what's coming out in the forefront for those. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And use hearing aids, everybody. We know it helps. So don't be afraid. Even if they're not ideal yet, they still help. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Comments, clarification. No question is a bad question. Concerns, fears. <laughs> if I could ask one question that, that not exactly on topic, but uh, thinking of UCI, um, are there other uh, studies going on right now, aside from this one, that some of our participants today could participate in? Oh, gosh, uh, absolutely. Uh, for, you know, I have to say with COVID happening, in fact, I think the last talk I gave, I was interested in recruiting people for tinnitus research and then we just you know that that did not happen thanks to COVID um but uh and in that that particular grant funding eventually stopped however we are looking at um there I know there's a person in our lab that she is headlining a study looking at more about the link between cognitive decline and auditory processing so she is doing a lot more measures of, of the cognitive battery of tests and looking at auditory brainstem responses in, in how those might change. Uh, in, in, and also uh, one behavioral task uh, that she has, which I believe is the same, we have the amplitude modulation task. So she's got the, the cognitive battery of tests, the, ele the electrophysiology by way of auditory brainstem responses, and then the behavioral, and she's looking at, in a general sense, the correlation between those. Uh, so anybody would probably qualify for that one. And I think she might even have a subcategory. I'm not sure, don't quote me on this, of people that have tinnitus for that, but I'm not completely sure on that. So um, 
we do have another study that's quite preliminary in our lab that is, is looking at tinnitus and the role of attention with EEG recordings. So that's for our lab. These are some of the main studies going on. And my email address, you can use and I can get you in touch with whoever you need to if you're interested in any of those studies. As far as other labs, um, I can't speak to the what's going on in the other labs in terms of the human research in recruiting because I, I right now I don't know since after COVID, I don't know who started up doing what. But yeah, so I can probably find out more for you if if you, uh, I think Dr. Hamid Jalilian is, he's often doing research. He spoke with you guys, I believe. Yeah. Can you, can you flip your slide back uh, a couple of slides sure. where it has your email address? Yeah, let me, that's a great, yeah, I meant to do that anyway, so. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anybody who would like to inquire, um, that's Michelle's um, email address. Yeah. So while you're thinking of other questions, I just want to bring up the topic about in-person meetings. Um, not every, all the clubhouses are open in Laguna Woods, where we would have our meeting. Um, we used to meet in uh, the last time we met, we met at the Performing Arts Center. It's not open yet. And, um, but I really have a preference now to move meetings to Clubhouse 7. The, the, the big room is looped. It's great. Um, and there wouldn't be an issue with um, outside guests coming through the gate. It, they, there's no security at that gate. And so I am looking into that and I'm waiting for a response. It's my understanding through rumor through the rumor mill that Clubhouse 7 won't be opening until January. So that would be the absolute soonest. And I'll have more information on that um, as time rolls on. I did want to mention um, we, our next meeting, and Anne, if you could um, uh, talk to us about uh, Anne and Mundell Noel and Laura Hunt will be presenting uh, November 9th, 2021, <laughs> at 11 o'clock. It'll be a Zoom meeting, and Anne, would you please let us know what that's going to be about? Yes, um, I am excited to say that this kind of follows up right with what Dr. Kapalowicz was talking about is oral rehab. There is a new program out and we are going to introduce you to it. It is called Amptify and it is a program that you can sign up for on your own or you can join our group um, and we may, we're, I'm trying to work something out for the HLAA members to get a discount, but you sign up for the oral rehab, you get to be in a group with an audiologist, it's um, through Amptify, it's not through our office, and you get to be um, in a hearing community and you get to play games and we are going excited to roll out the program for you and tell you more about it. They've had amazing success with it and it's very interactive. For those of you who like to play games on your phone, it's a wonderful way to do oral rehab. So they have different levels of background noise, they have different strategies that you can go about, but it is a, a great program that we look forward to telling you more about next month well, I look forward to that because I think I think I need some rehab oral rehab at this point well there used to be a couple apps out there that we had patients do when they first got fit with hearing aids but unfortunately 
like Starkey Here Coach, it is no longer supported um, through the App Store. So we have been on a diligent search looking for new programs because we know the value of oral rehab. Um, and for those of you who don't really know kind of oral rehab, what that is, is you think of oral ear rehabilitation. And you think, really? Do I need that? Well, if you got a knee replacement, even though you know how to walk, you would not do that without having physical therapy. So you have the therapist who knows how to push you and how to get you to do your best performance. And that's the idea behind oral rehab is that you're retraining the brain how to use the information correctly and to the best of your advantage. Great. So do we have anybody that thought of any questions yet? No. Okay. Well, I just I want to remind everybody that um, uh, two two things. Um, we are part of the Hearing Loss Association of America. National office is located on the East Coast. Um, their website is just outstanding. Uh, it, whenever you feel like you need to find something, you can search their website. It's, it's hearingloss.org, very simple, hearingloss.org. And, um, and I'm going to be including on the uh, Mission Viejo website, I'll be including events that they're having. They have uh, uh, webinars, and they have meetings, uh, and they have a lot of interactive uh, things. You can see that on hearingloss.org, and I'm going to add them to uh, the Mission Viejo chapter website, H-L-A-A-M-V dot org. Okay. Well, I think that really, uh, we've just kind of uh, cleared that up. Okay. Okay, well, Ken, you, you asked a question about her email address and there you got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, happy Halloween, everybody, if you do that sort of thing. <laughs> thank you, Tony, for your help. And thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to speak with you all again. So oh, thank Michelle, you. <laughs> wonderful. And you know, uh, Michelle did an outstanding uh, presentation on Tennessee, and it's on, it was recorded and it's on the uh, YouTube channel of Mission Viejo Chapter. And the easiest way for me to suggest how to get there is to go to HLAAMV.org and click on the YouTube button and you'll come to our chapter. And then you can go through the, uh, look through the videos and find uh, the Tinesis one. We had, we, had, we had so many people register for that, that and I only had a limit of 100 people. So there's a lot of people that tried to join the meeting and couldn't. So that's how, that's how yeah. it went off. that was really a very well attended meeting. Yeah, I think tinnitus is just such a hot topic. I think in general, uh, it really, it draws a lot of uh, interest. Uh, understandably so, yeah. Maybe we should try it again next year. Yeah, we could. Uh, yeah, and I, I know those slides, we, I recall, um, there was an issue. I think it was the first talk we did on Zoom. And so I think some of the slides are missing even. If anybody wants those, I, I still have them. I'm happy to email you all those as well if it helps. Um, and, and we do have more. I recently, uh, Professor Zhang and I uh, wrapped up a paper where we were collaborating with a group in China looking at how getting a cochlear implant actually helps with tinnitus treatment. And, um, it, and we look very specifically at whether the implant should be on the same ear, opposite ear, two implants versus one implant. Uh, we looked at uh, anxiety, sleep, and speech, and how it all, uh, how the implant, implant impacts all of these things relative to the tinnitus. So, you know, we, we could even, if you ever want to talk on that, I'm happy to give that if it's not overdone already. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say goodbye, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Uh, Anne and Laura, thank you, and all the participants. We wouldn't be here if you didn't show up. So, <laughs> and hope to see you all next month.
November 9th. Bye-bye. Bye.